Ready? Yes. I'm going to introduce you today. I mean, I know from you being here already two times, a lot of us already know who you are, but I still want to, for those who it's the first time of them seeing you, I want them to know who you are. This is John Armstrong, Dr. John Armstrong. He's an author, a mentor, and a minister. Uh, he's taught graduate level theology and lectured in many contexts. He began writing as a young boy. And by the time he reached his late 20s, he had published several reflections in print. And over the past 50 years, he's written for magazines, theological journals, and various newspapers. He considers his first significant book to be Your Church is Too Small. Uh, of course, today he's here to talk about chapter seven uh, from Tear Down These Walls, Following Jesus into Deeper Unity. He went to University of Alabama, real tight, and mm -hmm. then went to uh, Wheaton College, where he received his BA and MA, and then has a doctorate of ministry from Luther Rice Seminary in Atlanta. So thank you, John, for coming. My pleasure. Well, thank you again. And it's it's been a joy to be with you these two previous weeks, and uh, we have one more next week. So uh, we'll keep going. And... Uh, being able to use this technology uh, has been a bit of a double-edged sword. It's kept some people from being in some places, but it's also allowed me to be in Chicago and to talk to you in North Carolina and to have people join us from different states today. So that's encouraging as well that I simply have to walk across my deck uh, to my gazebo. I don't know if I've mentioned it in the past, but I'm seated and what you can see behind me are a couple of icons. Uh, this eight-cornered facility has eight icons in it that are significant to me, one of Paul, one of John. Uh, the one of John was actually consecrated on the altar of an Orthodox church by one of my dearest friends, the priest. So there's a lot of there's a lot of my life in this place. Uh, I constructed it about 20 years ago with money that my mother left me when she died. And she was my biggest champion for research and writing. So I thought she'd love this place. Um, and I got the idea basically from the late historian, popular historian, David McCullough. Uh, I saw on C-SPAN an interview with him, and he had this place in Massachusetts. It was outside his house where he had all his tools to work and write. And I said, that's what I need, a place that's private, a place that I can walk across my deck to get into, heated and air-conditioned so I can use it year-round. So I'm speaking to you from my writing hermitage, my gazebo, uh, and it's my pleasure to do so. Let me offer a word of simple, uh, straightforward uh, prayer to our Father that he would bless this time we share together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we ask for your mercies through Christ our Lord. We ask that you would grant us the Holy Spirit to think and hear and respond to ideas that we pray will glorify you. And we pray for the mission of your church that it would advance as Christians experience the work of the Holy Spirit in unity and in proclamation and in incarnating the Christian gospel in their uh, ministries to the poor, to the weak, to the needy, and to all peoples. We pray this through the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, welcome. I want to start. We're actually going to look, as was said in the introduction, at, at chapter seven of the book, and if it's not apparent, if you started reading the book uh, from the introduction, uh, I mentioned in, it was mentioned in my bio, Your Church is Too Small. That was an earlier version of this book. So why two books? Well, the first one was published by Zondervan, an evangelical publisher, mainstream publisher. And uh, it did very well, actually, in that form, uh, in terms of sales and readership and plowing ground that opened opportunities that I had some years ago because of that book. Uh, the background of that writing project was basically my wife suggesting to me that I was getting a lot of criticism from evangelical Protestants who were unhappy with my ecumenism and that I should write this book to explain what I really believed and what I was really practicing. So I did, and it did help. It it uh, galvanized some of my opposition. They were more opposed after they read the book, but it also opened wonderful doors of opportunity far beyond 
um, my sort of background context in Wheaton, I think the most significant early door it opened was that a, a friend, uh, a Catholic friend, uh, gave a copy of the book to the late uh, Francis Cardinal George in Chicago. Cardinal George had been interviewed, the Chicago Tribune, with reflections on his uh, his ministry in Chicago, and he'd battled cancer off and on for some years. And uh, he wanted to be the first Archbishop of Chicago to actually still be alive when his successor was in place, which actually happened. He died some months after Cardinal Supich was put in place as the new Archbishop. And he also said in this article that one of the things his office engaged in that he felt very strongly about was the work of ecumenism. And then he said, maybe as a almost a throwaway line, he said, I think it's sad that there's not more uh, synergy and work between Catholics and evangelical Protestants. And uh, that's where my book came in, was given to him. He invited me down to Chicago. We met. And the rest is history. He and I did a dialogue at Wheaton College, well attended. And that brought Catholics and evangelicals together in the Chicago West Suburban area in a way that hadn't happened previously. And we sort of, through the years, next 15 years or so, we built on that, that model. And uh, that's where the ministry that now is the initiative really got birthed. So that first book, Your Church is Too Small, was the precursor to this book, Tear Down These Walls. The biggest difference between the two books is that the first one was written before I knew some of the partners and people that I got to know because of the first book. Uh, the new book reflects some of those relationships and partnerships that I entered into that I could now tell stories about because I'd actually lived that part of the story. So um, that's the book that you have if you bought a copy of the book. Now, our subject today is, is uh, the four marks of the church. Uh, this is not my terminology. It's been used in Christian history to describe the words of the creed about the church, what we confess about the church. And we'll get to those in just a minute. But I want to begin in the chapter previous to that chapter with a brief word about the phrase Christ the center. Christ the center. For if, if ecumenism and the mission of Christ is to work, then we have to be clear that the center of all such effort is Christ himself. He is the center. Uh, this is a term that was used in the church. Uh, it was celebrated and used by Dietrich Bonhoeffer uh, before he was martyred in the 1940s in Germany. And uh, it, it uh, is a, a term that suggests uh, an idea of oneness that combines two commitments that I believe should be considered separately but never separated. Uh, the first commitment is to work in every conceivable way to demonstrate and express our God-given oneness with other Christians. I'm reminded of a friend I referred to last week, Father Tom Bema, the late Father Tom Bema, who was a mentor to me and was uh, actually became a kind of spiritual director in my life, in my work in ecumenism. We were dear friends. And I feel his loss every day because I've lost that, that friendship with someone who really loved ecumenical work and was a, a very devout Catholic theologian, teacher, and priest. Anyway, Tom and I discussed this quite often, and we understood, and he understood, that the uh, generative power of ecumenism in the 20th century began in the early part of the 20th century, in, in the first decade, when Christians on the mission field, Christians in far-flung nations and places outside of the Western church, began to encounter one another. And to some extent, in encountering one another, they found themselves competing the natural instinct was, well, we want to make Protestant Christians. Well, we want to make Catholic Christians. And so, uh, as Father Tom liked to say, more than once, the national people of a particular nation or ethnic group would ask these missionaries, well, what kind of Christian do you want us to be? Are we just Christians or are we a particular kind of Christians? And they were confused by these divisions and they kept pressing the question. And it was said, Tom, out of that background that they recognized that Christ was the center, not their creeds even, not their uh, denominational loyalties, not their brand, not their even their ethnicities and so forth, but that they were one because Christ was one and Christ was the center of their relationship. So understanding Christ as the center drove them to express uh, that oneness personally and begin to express it corporately as they could find opportunities for that. And that birthed 
what eventually came to fruition, uh, as we now know, in the World Council of Churches after World War II, uh, the World Council of Churches was birthed out of the seed that was sown uh, 40 plus years earlier in these missionaries and missiologists and Christian workers wanting to find ways to express unity rather than division. Secondly, I have a commitment that goes much further than that. Question. that is, yes, Question. yes, yes, yes. Does the World Council of Churches include the Catholic Church? I had that idea it was just Protestant. It's it's not just Protestant. The Orthodox Church is a member. The Catholic Church, interestingly, the Catholic Church is not a member, but the Catholic Church contributes in major ways in association with the World Council. For example, there's a, a major work of the Council is the Faith and Order Commission. And there are very much active Catholics on the Faith and Order Commission. So it gives you the idea that they're involved. Uh, their leaders and thinkers in ecumenism attend and support. Um, there's goodwill. But formally, they've not joined as a church, a whole church, with the World Council. The Orthodox Church, of course, consists... Any, any idea about why that's the case? Well, um, I think it has to do somewhat with their ecclesiology, but I'm not an authority on, on answering that. Uh, I think there was a reticence. Uh, I think in 1948, the Catholic Church was not ready for that yet. But of course, in the 1960s, we get to Vatican II, and one can read the decree on ecumenism and say, boy, they're ready now um, because of what they say in that decree. So there was, a, there was a shift that took place. It was already there in the 1940s. There were real ecumenists in the Catholic Church long before there was a decree on ecumenism, but it wouldn't have been written. But uh, I think that was the reticence. Um, was, was how... Sorry, I distracted you from what you were saying there. No, no, no. That's a, I'm glad you distracted me. That's a very good question. And I don't know that I've answered it as thoroughly as I could. Um, Bill, do you know, we've got a guest on here who's Catholic thinker, teacher. Do you know any more about that question and my response than what I said? No, just along the lines that you've put it. I don't know the details of the reason, but I, you know, they may be being reconsidered even now, but yeah, I, I can't add more. Yeah, I, I think, I don't know how much it's being reconsidered, but I've been to the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity, as I said last week in Rome, and I know that they're these leaders that I met, they all attend the World Council's meetings, which take place every seven years, uh, and they very actively support it. So without a formal involvement, they're involved, um, is probably the best and most charitable way to put it. So a good question, though. Um, and some of this, again, has to do with ecclesiology or their doctrine of the church, of the sacraments, of things like that. Um, that would be true of, of certain uh, more evangelical groups who uh, are part of the World Evangelical Alliance, WEA. Uh, it's an alternative form of ecumenism more expressed historically by evangelicals. But the WEA and the World Council of Churches in the last 15 years, they, they're not merged, but they act like they're partners together in world ecumenism, which is very delightful to me to see that movement among uh, globally involved evangelicals. And again, I want to stress the people that are doing this are mostly missiologists and missionaries. Um, their, their commitment is not to a theoretical ecumenism, but to one that serves the kingdom of God and the mission of Jesus, uh, as it should be. So um, my background, one of my degrees was in missiology, and uh, I think that was a background that prepared me for this journey in ecumenism. So um, I'm not satisfied with informal expressions of oneness, though I pursue them and have them. Uh, I think we are profoundly individualistic in American culture. I think that's evident in our present political uh, divisions, uh, that we seek our own individual ways, and we don't have much of a communitarian uh, idea. But I can't buy that because it's not New Testament Christianity. New Testament Christianity is profoundly committed to community. And so the oneness of the church is involved in uh, in, in all of us being one together uh, in community. Now, one of the most significant passages I'm looking, I got all these books around me and I got to find my Bible. So I'm going to go to my phone <laughs> um, and find my Bible on my phone if I can open it. Um, well, let me just bring it from the best memory I can. Ephesians 4, uh, 4 to 7 is so significant 
in all of this in terms of the theology of oneness and its practical outworking. Uh, when Paul says there, there is one Lord, one God and Father of us all, um, and he says uh, there is one baptism. Now, I, I, uh, I've i mentioned that I grew up a Baptist, but I eventually, my ordination was uh, accepted, and I became a member of the Reformed Church in America. And in that process, of course, I came into a church that practices pedo-baptism, or the baptism of, of young children, uh, even infants. And that was completely foreign to my background. Um, and so when I was examined, uh, the examiners who were elders and presbyters, they questioned how I came to the conclusion that I could accept infant baptism. And I'll never forget one of the, the questions was this, don't you see that it's rooted in Paul's reference to uh, the Philippian jailer and the baptism of his whole household, that the baptism of the household would clearly include infants? And I said, no, I actually can make a case against that interpretation because there's no clear evidence there were infants in the household. And I said, as a Baptist, I could argue against it. He said, well, then how come you came to believe that you could accept infant baptism? I said, Ephesians 4. I said, I no longer believe that only one interpretation of the mode or the method or the person being baptized was acceptable. Uh, and that therefore put me in the mainstream of, of the Christian church uh, in accepting that baptism uh, whether it was pouring, sprinkling, or immersing, or some combination. There are combinations of those. There are churches that immerse three times called trine immersion. Uh, there are churches that baptize uh, in using water three times in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there are different ways baptism is administered. But if it's Christian baptism, and I would agree with Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant thought at this point, it's Trinitarian baptism. It's in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we read in Matthew. If that's true, then who am I to say that's not a baptism, which is what I had to do as a Baptist. I had to say your baptism is not acceptable. You have to be immersed in our context. And Just, uh, just one thing uh, yeah. to note, there are four instances in the New Testament of baptisms of households. Yes. Uh, the word household, oikos, uh, refers to everybody who lives within that household, including children, infants, servants. Right. Uh, it is, uh, and maybe, you know, you could, could argue this either way, but I think that's plenty of evidence that infants uh, were baptized in New Testament times. Yeah, well, I, I agree with you, obviously. But what I what I didn't agree with was is that that was the slam dunk proof. In other words, that what you said is true. And therefore, it makes it highly likely. But a proof is not the same thing as highly likely. We would agree on that, I'm sure. So I agree it's highly likely. I agree that infants were baptized. I think that there was a, um, you know, if John's baptism was a baptism of repentance, uh, you know, that's that's sort of the model, and Baptists would argue from that forward to what became Christian baptism. And again, I know both arguments. So I am persuaded, is my point. I am finally persuaded by Ephesians 4. There's one baptism, not two, not mine and yours. Uh, you see, I can't divide Christians up over the mode, the method, or the candidate for baptism in their age. Can't do it. So I accept Christian baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Does that help? So I, I don't disagree. Good point. Very good point. Fair. Okay, so, so Ephesians 4 was where I went. Um, one God, one Father, uh, one church. One church. Not two. Not three separations. Not four. And the fact is, the tragic fact of our history is that we are divided. And we can put spins on that division, uh, the traditional sort of polemics of Catholics and Protestants. Uh, the Protestants will say, well, the Catholic Church walked away from the gospel. It lost the gospel. The Reformers restored the gospel. And uh, the Catholic Church still doesn't grasp the gospel. That is a, that is a very, uh, I want to use the right word, that's not a very good uh, understanding of the development of, of the theology 
of both Protestant and Catholic churches since the Reformation. Um, the great document on Lutheran and Catholic accord, um, which has been debated by some conservative Catholics and some very conservative Lutherans negatively, but it is widely agreed by both Lutherans and Catholics that that accord answered the questions that divided the church over the gospel. Uh, and I'm of that opinion uh, that it did. So uh, I don't think the gospel divides us. Uh, the way we use terminology, the way we talk about faith and works and those kinds of common hot buttons uh, divides us. But that's not the position of the church partners in these conversations about, about faith and order which is a major part of the World Council of Churches and its theology. So uh, I believe there's one church. Now, the real fact is tragically, and I underscore tragically, that one church has been divided and is now polarized, uh, has been for centuries, and is polarized into uh, divisions. Now, let me just give a kind of a Protestant reflection on something that precedes the Reformation. And that is this, in the Catholic Church, there was division before the Reformation. I mean, we had two papacies at one point, uh, one in Avignon in France and one in Rome. Uh, we had uh, divisions over various things that took place in the church, various movements. But what the Catholic Church did beautifully to forego unnecessary separations was to find ways to embrace and respond to various movements, we would call them as Protestants, inside the church. So we have... Uh, Francis of Assisi and the Franciscans. That's a movement, became an order. And that order still exists down to the present day. Uh, and the Pope has honored that order by being named Pope Francis, first Pope Francis in history. So that was a major contributor to the church. In fact, some would say that without Francis, the church might have divided much earlier. Uh, and I tend to believe that's quite possible, though again, not provable. We have Benedictines. We have, we have, uh, uh, a number of orders that are now American. The first American Catholic order were the Paulists. Uh, and it is, interestingly, a missional ecumenical order. Uh, that wasn't exactly how it was founded. It was founded to bring about the mission of Christ through Catholics in, a, in an American context. It was the first American recognized order by the Vatican in the 19th century. But the founder was deeply influenced by Emersonian thought by various American strands of thought that were influencing the Catholic Church as it began to take root in American soil. And they wanted to find a way to express that unity and be Catholic. And so the Paulists were born. They're, the, uh, they're a publishing arm, the Paulist Press, a good one. Uh, and the Paulists are good friends of mine. They're, they're champions for ecumenism. They've embraced me. I've stayed in their house with their, their priests and directors and, and leaders. Uh, and known some of their, their, their key people. Their home base is in New York City. I've been in their cathedral, uh, their church. It, it, it's a beautiful order. And so there are these orders, and these orders bring about the, the, uh, the diversity of the Catholic Church without dividing it. Um, and so people like me look back and say, what if the Catholic Church in the time of Luther had seen him as a reformer and, and embraced what he was saying as an order? Now, that's too simplistic because on both sides, there were complications. Catholic Church was not ready to do that with someone like Luther. And Luther, frankly, by, uh, over some time, was not ready to do it with the Catholic Church. So unfortunately, the division took place. Uh, my Protestant background, conservative background, at times wanted to argue that the division was helpful because it created the modern missions movement. But uh, if you read uh, Bosch's great book on Christian mission, you'll see that the Catholic Church has had vibrant mission and mission, mission orders and mission societies long before the Reformation and long after it. So um, I don't buy that argument either, that out of pragmatism, Protestant Reformation was ultimately a good thing. Uh, I don't deny that it ended up producing great good, and I'm still comfortable in my own conscience in being a Protestant, but uh, I don't stay there out of a polemical defense mechanism uh, of any kind. So unless there's any, let me, let me pause. Good, good point to take any questions about all that I've just said about Christ the center and about uh, Catholic and Protestant mission and ecumenism. Anyone? I'll go to these four marks of the church next. One quick comment. Uh, yes. 
one of my heroes is Nicholas Kristof, who's an op-ed writer for the New York Times. And yes. he recurrently, about once every year, he'll start talking about how wonderful Catholic nuns are who are providing uh, medical care and uh, care for dying people in poor countries and, and what uh, perfect exemplars they are of the Christian faith. And uh, so... Uh, it's it's nice to it's nice to hear that and to be reminded of of that total dedication of love and service that we don't have too many examples of in the Protestant Church. I don't think. I mean, there's some, but not to the same degree. I don't think. Yeah, I think I'd say we don't to the same degree because we don't have the the force of unity of a global church. Um, we're globally divided. So, you know, a, a Lutheran church and a Methodist church and a Presbyterian church in America may get along quite well and do some things in their community, but globally, um, they don't do it in the way the Catholic uh, church can do it through mission orders, through nuns, et cetera. So that's a very good point. I do think, however, that there's a, a rising increase of association of certain Protestants with that very Catholic uh, conception of, of how Matthew 25 works itself out in works of charity and love and so forth. Um, and I, I welcome that. I think it's a good thing. It's a necessary thing, quite frankly. You know, the background I come from, and some of you can identify with this, was mission was preaching the good news and making disciples. Uh, the other work was, was uh, social, it was good, it was important, but it was not mission. Uh, I'm of the opinion that they're both mission. And the problem is, is that we've, pit, historically, we've pitted one against the other. One has a higher place for some Protestants. And for some Catholics, the social compassion of Matthew 25 and so forth uh, exceeds any desire to make uh, disciples um, who are faithful to Christ and, and enter his church. Um, I, 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 by the way, I've, I've written this on more than a few blog posts and websites. I, I don't, I'm not on Facebook, but I do, I'm sorry. Well, let me finish this thought I was going to make. Um, whenever I hear Protestants or Catholics talk about Christians leaving their church to enter the other church. So Protestant, I was reading an article recently or saw a Facebook post, not Facebook, I'm sorry, a YouTube post with a video uh, by a conservative Catholic who was talking about Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, right? He was a Presbyterian minister. He went to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. He had a calling of God to do evangelization of children. And so he was following his calling and what he was doing on Mr. I mean, that whole story of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and, and PBS and all that is just astounding story. And I love Mr. Rogers, the person. I did not know this, but this conservative Catholic says like a week before he died, he entered the Catholic church. Well, my response is God bless him. If that's what he was led to do, then I'm perfectly happy that he did that. But the way these conservative Catholics were attributing this was is that he really entered the true church before he died. And I put a post up and said, I wish that you would use the word conversion in a more biblically nuanced way of people who are not Christians becoming Christians. Um, that's the origin of the idea of conversion in the Bible. Uh, it's not one Christian leaving one part of the church to go into another part of the church. Um, and Protestants do that in most ways far more than Catholics do. My evangelical background, we always talked about Catholics who came into our church as converts. Uh, they weren't Christians, and now they are. Um, and that leaving that behind and not supporting that kind of approach uh, made me enemies on both sides. Uh, very conservative Catholics weren't happy with what I said, and conservative evangelicals were not happy either. Uh, but that's a remnant of this long-standing division, sadly. And it hinders our mission. Uh, it really does. Okay, unless there's a question, I'll move on. Four marks. This should go pretty easily, and then we'll have some more questions. The four marks are, are somewhat obvious. They're in the Creed. Um, three are in the Apostles' Creed. The fourth one is in the Nicene Creed. And the first one is the church is one. 
one holy Catholic and apostolic church are the four marks. The church is one. And uh, that means not simply that it's just one, uh, but as in the words of Ephesians 4, 4, there is one body, not two bodies, not three bodies, not partial bodies. There's one body, one church. Now, there are two ways the word one was used in the creed that I think reflect New Testament thought. One is that the church is unique. There's nothing else like it. Um, again, that's not a judgment of other people that aren't Christians. Uh, it's not a repudiation of interreligious work, mission, conversation, the whole thing. But it's a way of saying the church is unique. It's, it belongs to God. The church is the body of Christ. It's unique, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. And secondly, the word one is used uh, to uh, preserve uh, this uniqueness, this oneness. Um, I said I said uniqueness from Ephesians 4. I meant to say that's what we preserve. The uniqueness is seen in 2 Corinthians 4, 5. Uh, the characteristics of our mission uh, lead us to unity, but not necessarily to conformity. Another major problem for both the mission of the church and the unity of the church. Unity is not uniformity. We don't have to copy each other Fair. to preserve unity and be a part of the one church. Unity is not uniformity. And finally, the unity of the Holy Spirit if the Spirit is at work and the Church is the work of the Holy Spirit, which most Trinitarian theologians uh, see, that the Church is uniquely being called out of and into and formed by and strengthened by the work of the Holy Spirit present in the Church, then that means the Holy Spirit is operating through gifts, diversities of gifts, diversities of the work of the Spirit. The Spirit is creative. The Spirit works to bring glory to Christ. Uh, and so there has to be this wide diversity because of the ministry and presence of the Holy Spirit. Let me read, it's just on page 62, if you have the book in front of you, at the bottom of the section on the church is one, the last paragraph, I quote from the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, which said, and I quote, the church of the 21st century will be, as it has always been, a church of many cultures, languages, and traditions, yet simultaneously one, as God is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, unity in diversity. So this came from a document entitled Welcoming the Stranger, the church that recognizes its uniqueness in its diversity is a church that is able to welcome the stranger, the person who's different. Um, and this is why racism and anything remotely like it is one of the great heresies of the Christian movement. I don't often hear the word heresy used except in ways regarding the classical doctrine of the Trinity and the Incarnation, which I can use the word accurately that way. But it's surprising to me that I don't hear more people saying that the great present heresy of the last several centuries, really for longer than that, of the Christian church has been racism. And yet in uh, Galatians 3.28, uh, there's no room in Christian baptism for racism. It's right there at the beginning. I read a book. I think it may be referenced in my text. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure it is on Galatians 3.28, in which a New Testament scholar makes the case that this was the confession that was spoken in the baptism of Christian converts in the first century. That they confessed that there was no male or female uh, and that there was no division over race or ethnicity. The church baptized people into oneness, not into a black church or a white church or a Hispanic church. Um, I don't need to beat this drum, but it's still true, as it was true before the civil rights movement. It's still true today that though maybe we don't put signs out saying uh, whites only, that most of our churches are white and most of our churches are black, but hardly ever are they mixed together in any fruitful way. Um, and I, I think there are reasons for that, but I don't think we actually believe that such division is a harm to the work of the church and to the calling of Christ, that we actually work against it. Um, you know, we don't even have conversations about why this is so, and we ought to. Um, the mission of Christ demands it. The unity and uniqueness of the church that is one demands it. So um, that's the first mark. The well, second- I've got a question. 
Um, this goes back just to the concept of the church and its origins. And I was a little surprised when you said that the church is a, a unique organization in the world as a Christian church. So my question is, is the term church used in the New Testament? I think it is, but I'm not really sure. And, and was it used before the time of Jesus by anybody, or do you know? And we have congregations in the Jewish religion, but they're not called churches, but couldn't they be considered as churches? Well, that's a broad and a big question, but it's a good question. Um, the word for church, of course, is ecclesia, and it was used in non-New Testament uh expressions in Greek. Uh, it really simply referred to the gathering, uh, to the assembly, probably the closest English word we might have is an assembly. Uh, and it was used by the writers of the New Testament to describe the assembly of Christ, the gathering of those who are Christ followers into the assembly. Uh, congregation is another word that would at least broadly fit the idea. Uh, the congregation is made up of a group of people uh, and that assembly does the work of Christ. Now, to really get a good uh, doctrine of the church, I think you've got to go particularly and almost not totally. I mean, actually, in Jesus mentions the church only twice in the Gospels, both in Matthew, Matthew 16 and Matthew 18. Matthew 16, he talks about the discipline of the church. And in Matthew 18, he, uh, he talks about it as well. Um, and both of these texts, refer to it in the words of Jesus, but they don't elaborate. They don't develop it. It's Paul that develops it. And what we see in Paul is that, um, and this surprises some people, Paul is not going around making individual converts. He was making individual converts through his work, but he was drawing those converts through their baptism and their involvement into communities, into ecclesia. So that's the way the word is used in, in Paul, and that's the way we've inherited it uh, over the centuries in that sense of being the body of Christ, the community of Christ, the congregation of Christ. And it's it's formed by faith and by baptism, and it expresses itself through its commitment to follow Christ and to do the work he's called us to do together. Um, so that that's how I would use it. So did the word exist? Yes. Was it used in a, an explicitly Christocentric uh, pneumatical, that is spirit sense of this of this group of people that were baptized into Christ and were his people? Uh, no, uh, the Jews didn't use it that way. They had gatherings. And uh, I'm pretty sure, though I'm not going to be check myself on this one, that uh, ecclesia is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to decide to, de to determine gatherings of Israel as ecclesia. But it wasn't used in this Christian sense. The marker, I think, became following Christ and following Christ in baptism and living the Christ life together in the life of a community uh, of Christians. Uh, I had the privilege in Rome to go into several first century house churches. Um, I didn't know much about it until someone said, have you been in any of the paleo churches? And I knew paleo meant ancient, old, but I didn't know what they were talking about. And I asked a few questions and found out that you can go to churches above ground, you can see them, but you can go down steps and into what would appear like a like a basement, except it's stone, it's carved out, and it really was the living room of a home. And the reason the church, is, the modern, more modern churches built over it is that was a first century church. And they didn't, you know, the, the, the Roman uh, the city uh, was in several layers like ancient cities can be. And the first layer was a home in the first century. And then later, it was built on top of as the city developed and evolved over the centuries. So there I was in this nicely cooled underground place and recognizing I was in what was an ancient living room. And it had carved out of three sides. It had a stone sort of a bench. I estimated that about 30 to 40 people could be in there. In the middle of the room was a stone table, and in the corner of the room was natural wa water uh, from spring pouring into a little pool, not big enough to immerse. But a little, So you had water, you had a table, you had seating. And I thought, that's it. That was an ancient church, and that's where they gathered. 
Um, by the way, they didn't call their, their buildings churches, but that came to be a common usage because the place they met was where the congregation assembled. So the, the name stuck, uh, that the church and the building got connected. The downside of that is that a lot of people think the church is going to the building and they're in the church. But uh, that's not how they used it in the New Testament. Does that help? Okay. No further question. I'll, I'll move on. Second mark. I'm going to have to move pretty fast to get these, and I want to I want to at least touch on them. Second mark is the church is holy. Leviticus 11.45 says, Be holy, says the Lord, for I am holy. Now, we got a lot of strange ideas about holiness. We even have churches that are called holiness. Holiness this and holiness Pentecostal. Uh, holiness this kind of church and that. But again, here again, the New Testament idea of a church being marked by holiness is that the church corporately, the life of the church itself is marked by holiness. It doesn't mean, and this is important, that every member of the church is as holy as they can be. I mean, Paul has things to say about people that that defy holiness and how the church should respond to them. And uh, that's been abused and misused by a lot of Christians over the years. Um, we went, we've we gone through periods when anybody that doesn't agree on anything gets excommunicated. Uh, but the church did take its corporate holiness seriously. Uh, there was always an abiding tension between what we are in Christ and what we are urged to become. And I think that's the, the centerpiece of this. I am not as holy as I need to be, but in the Lord, I am holy. I am marked with holiness. I'm marked to be set apart. That's the idea. I'm set apart for uncommon use to serve Christ in holiness. Uh, I won't read it because of time, but in my book on page uh, 63, I quote uh, uh, Johnson, uh, who, by the way, is a Catholic professor, now retired uh, at Emory University in Atlanta, and what he says about holiness. And he says two things that are important. He says, this holiness, a mark of the church, was not moralizing or moralism. Um, people sought to live holy lives, morally holy lives. But when it becomes a, a kind of checklist or a rigid uh, code, uh, and that happened in the first century, definitely in the second century, that certain Christians adopted codes that were different than other Christians, and then made those sort of requirements. This is part of what uh, created divisions uh, in terms of the influence of Marcion and even the Gnostics, uh, which we know a bit about if you want to get into that, that uh, broad field. But these movements in the church would create uh, rigid codes that people were required to keep to be active and in good standing in the church. I don't believe that's helpful. I don't believe it's what is meant by being holy. So I have to go quite quickly, but the third mark is the word Catholic. Now I want to talk about this one a little bit more. Um, I had a tradition, uh, and I still see it in certain Protestant churches, where they, they say the creed in corporate worship, but they leave the word Catholic out or they substitute a word. And so they'll say, well, let's replace the word Catholic with, I, I believe in the one holy universal church well the problem with that is the church is universal and the word catholic means universal uh, so you're just substituting one word for another word uh, i actually like the word catholicos catholic from the greek because what it really meant this is important the definition was that which uh, exists throughout the whole world it was a global phenomenon it was meant to expand as jesus said to the ends of the earth and so the church was a world-expanding, world-embracing community um, for the good of people and for the good of community. So the Christians lived their love in community and shared that love with their neighbors and with those who especially were poor and rejected. And uh, that was part of its success. Remember I said last week the church at the end of the first century was not very large. Uh, we somehow, especially in certain evangelical circles, think that if we preach the gospel faithfully, the church will just grow like numerically, just way off the charts. Well, that hasn't happened for 75 years in America. The growth decade was the 50s, and we've seen very little serious growth in the church at large since the 50s and 60s. So um, 
Johnson, just as a reference on page 64, um, this is a great quote. Um, he says, as applied in the creed to the ideal church, it means both a universality of extent and an inclusiveness that embraces differences within a larger unity. It's an inclusive word, and it embraces differences within the larger unity. It's Catholic. He says, and I quote him again, the creed does not say the church is Roman Catholic. That term is indeed oxymoronic. It combines the element of universality with a highly particular adjective. The Roman Catholic tradition, and then he says, the reader will remember it is my own, may believe the Roman tradition is all-encompassing, but that is simply mistaken. Um, he'd get a real debate on that uh, among Catholic scholars and, and people, but I think he's right, and I don't think uh, many of my friends and uh, Catholic friends who are ecumenical and mission-oriented would disagree. Uh, so when we say the church is Catholic, we're saying it goes beyond the local gathering, and we're saying that it allows for personal differences that do not divide the unity, differences not in things that are central to the creed and to the gospel. This is this is where the creed becomes significant. Uh, it becomes a not just words that are said, but a way of identifying what is at the core of this one Catholic church. Um, so let me, one more comment about this matter of Catholicity. Um, my own background, my Baptist background was, to say the least, was non-creedal. We didn't say a creed, we didn't read creeds, we didn't talk about creeds. Um, I would say to some extent it had elements of anti-creedal Christianity in it that anybody who did use a creed we thought was suspiciously lacking in biblical knowledge and understanding. Um, and we stressed the visible church, our church, as the visible church. And we generally didn't talk about the church as a, as a Catholic community that expanded over the whole earth. We talked about Baptists going overseas and making Christians uh, that were of similar persuasion to us you had a movement in the, in the 19th century, in the South particularly, among Baptists uh, that argued that the Baptist church was the true church. And this argument went to great lengths to argue, uh, it was called landmarkism, and it was a major issue in Baptist history. It threatened to divide Southern Baptists at a time when they were growing and, and in their infancy in the 19th century into two groups. And to some extent, there was a division. There are still landmarkers, we called them, who said they were the true church. So only their baptism was real. Only their gatherings were real. They were the church. Everybody else was not. Um, so you see how Baptists did that, even though uh, their ecclesiology, their doctrine of the church shouldn't lead them that way. They, they were led that way. There's always been this desire, it seems, to say who is and who isn't. And Catholicity, rightly understood, doesn't do that. It doesn't sanction that. It's not necessary. It's not help, helpful or healthful. Let me quickly go, so we've got some minutes left, to the fourth mark, apostolic. That one is pretty self-evident. Um, it's not The word is not in the, the Apostles' Creed, but it is in the Nicene Creed. The church, we're saying when we say it's apostolic, that it's intimately and historically linked with the apostles. Now, I'm not saying that that the, back to the landmark illustration among Baptists, I'm not saying that um, only certain people are linked with the, with the apostles and others are not. That defies the first three marks of the church. You can understand apostolic in, in two ways. I think you should understand it in two ways. Number one, it was a statement to combat incipient Gnosticism, which threatened the gospel and the church as probably the most virulent early heresy uh, that that uh, would divide the church. By the way, I should have said this earlier, I'm talking about Paul planting churches. Uh, Paul was never content to go into a community, baptize some converts, and move on. When you read his letters, what's obviously true is that he's impassioned about keeping the church united, keeping it faithful, and going back to it and writing letters to it to express how to do that. So you have a letter like the letter to the Colossians, and Paul is appealing to them as the Ephesians for their oneness and their life together in their community to be healthy. Paul was building healthy congregations, healthy communities, healthy churches in the way we've defined it. The second thing that this idea of, of uh, 
apostolic reminds us of is that we're called to protect the oneness given to us by the apostles and especially Paul. If Paul labored for the oneness of his congregations and for their unity and their harmony, then so should we. Paul in Philippians, for example, appeals to two women that he names by name. How'd you like to be have the name and have it included in one of Paul's letters? That they get along with each other. He doesn't even tell us why they didn't get along. One could guess, but he says you got to get along. You, you can't you can't do this to the church. You're inherently pulling it apart. And uh, he calls out certain people by name. And then he ends many of his letters. Romans 16 is classic. He ends his letter by naming all these various people who are vital to the life of that congregation in Rome. He wasn't content to speak of it theoretically, but to speak of it in a way that connected it to its apostolic founding through the gospel of Paul, which was the gospel of Jesus, of course. So uh, apostolic uh, continues on with the idea that there is going to be tension in the church. There's going to be conflict, but Paul calls the church to oneness. One last thing, at the end of this chapter, there are three questions for discussion. Uh, and I want to just call your attention to the last one. It's certainly worthy of thought, if not actual discussion. If you want to discuss it, we can. I ask this question, what brings about conflicts within your church? If you're in any church I've ever been in, they've been conflicts. Um, I don't know, a Catholic parish, though the church maintains the, the marks of the, the creed regarding the church, that doesn't have divisions. They may not like something their priest does. The difference, however, is that a Catholic priest, a Catholic church, has a bishop they can appeal to on behalf of the problem in the church. A lot of our congregations are very independent of that kind of bishop or leadership outside the church. I'm pretty persuaded that we need, um, we need people, call them bishops, call them whatever, who the local church can appeal to for help to preserve its unity. But uh, there are divisions in churches of all kinds. So what caused conflict in your church? Have you ever experienced a church division? Well, I have. First church I pastored, I mentioned in my book, was a church that was a division from a division from a division. And I was the pastor of a church that rejected the church that actually ordained me as a Baptist. How's that? Church that ordained me and the church that I was ministering in didn't like each other. They wouldn't have anything to do with each other. And here I was, the pastor of one of the church that had rejected the other. I mean, that's the kind of uh, ridiculous division we can see. What could, have, what could have been done, I asked, to prevent these divisions or conflicts? What should we do now to prevent it from ever happening again? And I'll finish with this. Most Americans, they kind of pick the church the way they pick where they're going to go shopping. You know, and there was a time, of course, in the Catholic Church when you didn't have that option. You went to the church in the area where you're, where the local parish was. Now in the suburban Chicago where I live, we're in the Joliet Diocese, uh, and we have three Catholic churches in my community, and one's the big one, one's the small one, more ethnically based, and the third one is, uh, is probably, if I had to use the word, the most conservative of the three, and and. You know, I know people that live within a, a, a block of one church that drive four miles to go to the other one. That generally wouldn't have been done 40 years ago, uh, but that's very common to America, that uh, if you don't like the church you're in, you drive past it. Now, don't misunderstand me. You may be at Duke Chapel because you passed some churches to go where you really felt you ought to be, um, but that's not the problem. The problem is if I don't have what I want, I go looking for it. So, um, enough said. I think that's enough fodder for a few more questions. Anyone? Well, you're awfully silent. John, I have a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned racism. You yes. mentioned individualism. Um, you kind of bring us back to the New Testament idea of the church is one. Um, are these all manifestations of the same problem or just a, a whole complex of problems that make us not even imagine being together? You know, like, I, what's at the bottom of it? Or is it just many, many, many 
influences don't even get us to conceive that the churches should be one or are one, you know, to see things different. Yes. yes. That is a great question. And I don't know that I can adequately answer it, but I think it's, I think it's a both and. I think it's, we, we have these, I mean, in this sense, there's nothing new under the sun. The things that got Yodia and Syntyche at odds in Philippi probably exist in most churches today, right? And uh, we have teachers that come into church. I've seen them at every church I've ever been a member of. There's been somebody in the church who favors themselves as the theological mind of that church. And they tend to draw people to themselves and their ideas. Um, that's especially true in evangelical churches, but it's true in other kinds of churches. Um, uh, there are... There are people who who just, you know, some of this is ego. Uh, some of it is is a strong opinion about knowing what I know against everyone else. Uh, but the racism is is particularly uh, harmful because it goes right against Galatians three and our commitment and our baptism that we're not divided ethnically and racially, and yet we are and we still are and we still haven't gotten this together. Will we ever get it together? I suppose this side of the eternal kingdom, the answer is no. But I also believe that we ought to continually be reforming and working at getting it right. And uh, we'll never get it right for sure if we don't try. Uh, so, um, but I, I don't know. I wonder, Bill, if, I wonder if pastors, priests, parishioners, I wonder if they see the heresy of what they're doing. <laughs> Let's use that word that what they're doing is more heretical or as heretical as somebody coming in who's who's a Montanist. They wouldn't even know what that is today. Or someone coming in and and denying the, a, a basic idea of how the church formulated the Trinity. Um, very few people in modern churches I know would recognize that if they saw it. But if they did see it, they'd probably make a bigger deal out of that than their racism and all the other stuff that they're guilty of. So I think we're pretty selective in how we pick our heresies that we think are important. And I, I don't think, I think that's human, but it sure is a, it sure is a problem. And I think here's, here's another one. This may apply to some of you in the, in the chapel, in your, in the room there. Uh, I think there's a tendency in some of our more progressive expressions of the church in America to believe that we have found what's wrong with these Christian nationalist evangelicals, um, Boy, I'm I am I am I'm not hostile to people, but I am hostile to the idea of Christian nationalism big time. But to say that and to speak to it is fairly easy for me because I'm not drawn to it at all. But what am I drawn to? You know, what are the things that I like about my church that maybe are wrong uh, and what I want? Um, so it really requires a constant searching of the soul and the mind to say, what is wrong with me? Where, where am I wrong? Uh, so I want this to, for everyone hearing me to be personalized to asking the question, how do I contribute to the unity of the church? How do I contribute to this disunity? That's why that question three is there. Make it personal. Thank you, John. <clears throat> Everything's just been tremendous, John. I'm just uh, was not able to make it in today. I'm I'm remote, but um, uh, wow! From the opening comments, the inspiration of the gazebo that from your mother, right down to these final questions of wrestling with the heresies we might have and just reforming ourselves continually. Just you, just thank you. Just the chiming in from abroad wasn't there for the introduction, but um, just thank you so much. You're you're are you a conformist or nonconformist? You got your baseball hat on backwards. <laughs> That used to be a sign of nonconformity. Now it's conformity. <laughs> Isn't that funny how things change? <laughs> Again, Griffey a, made it cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a sign of I was on a hike with my with my daughter, had a Girl Scout thing. And just, uh, yeah. But uh, um, uh, well, yeah. 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 Thanks, Doug. <laughs> well, I think we're kind of done here looking at my clock. I say 944. How are we doing there? One more quick question if somebody has it. Does anybody have a quick one? I want to say thank you also, because I know this is, I have a Baptist background as well, but just throughout different experiences um, with the church I was involved in, with my own family, with people around me, and just continuing on and on, I have 
um, to uh, share a lot of the beliefs that you have been giving us here. And, uh, you know, and it is a journey. And I think so much of it comes down to humans are humans. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, you're going to, you're going to behave certain ways at certain mm -hmm. times. And it's, it's just something, like you said, we have to constantly work on to remind people of who they're supposed to reflect, what they're supposed to reflect. And that should be their identity and not trying to, you know, exert their power or influence over people. Yes. Um, well, that you just, you just use what would be a fun thing to jump into next week is power. power. What does power have to do with all of this? Back to uh, Bill's question. I think uh, the way we understand the kingdom of God, the way the church has understood power and use power from the very beginning, really, right to the present, has been corrupted in so many ways. The power of Jesus was to divest himself of power <laughs> and to go to the cross and to be raised, not to be a warrior, but to be a humble servant who saves people to make them like himself. Enough said. Well, thank you again. We truly appreciate it. We want to show our appreciation in the class and online. We uh, and we know we get to have you next week as well to emphasize chapter 11, why the church still matters. Uh, so it's just, it's been a wonderful conversation. And again, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.